Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong. I am Mark Ellis, joined, as always, by my delightful co-host, Jacqueline Coley. And Jacqueline, you know, you get to do these kind of episodes once you get past the 100 benchmark, you know, because, like, we've been waiting to do... This is This might be the most highly anticipated episode in Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong history. But before we get to that, you and I are just freshly back from San Diego Comic-Con. What was your What was your favorite part of the weekend? Everything uh, that was said after those drummers came out for the Black Panther portion of the Marvel panel. I'm just going to call it the Black Panther panel because I know like there were other people there and other things happened. It was just the Black Panther panel as far as I was concerned. It was the Black Panther weekend. That's all we care about. So it was, it was a pretty it was a pretty great moment. I, I feel like Jack and I had the best Comic-Con interaction you could possibly have because we never I did the math. We never actually yeah. spoke to one another. But Jacqueline was in the audience for something I was doing and I was in the audience for something Jacqueline was doing. So we saw each other on the lighted stage. And that, kids, sometimes is enough. And honestly, in this industry, that is real friendship. <laughs> <laughs> The fact Texting that we your showed friend. up. Yep. You showed up for your friend, texted them as you're leaving. I was at your thing. Bye. You did good. Here's the pick. Like, it's yeah, literally right. like. <laughs> Here's proof that I was in the audience bearing witness to you walking the boards. And um, yeah. And so and so now we're back and we're in our respective home studios getting to do RT is wrong again. And like I said, there's episodes you're excited to do. There's episodes about big time movies. And then there's the ones that everybody is waiting. They are just waiting with bated breath for you to finally announce. And it is here today. We're talking about a goofy movie from 1995 rated G. It is 70% on the audience score, which is fine news. Barely fresh on the tomato meter, 61%. And we have a very special guest joining us here today who also was at Comic-Con doing all the things, hosting stuff, uh, walking around, mingling at all the, 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 the best parties. And now she's back home doing what she does best, which is everything from acting to writing. You've seen her in a Disney movie. You've seen her in Ralph Breaks the Internet. You know her from writing on for Netflix, HBO Max. Uh, she just had a DC Comics run with Harley Quinn. She is also the mother of Molly, the one, the only. Miss Danny Fernandez is in the virtual building. Danny, we finally did it. We got you on the show. Whoa, I have campaigned for this so much. It's wild. <laughs> I was going to say, we don't need to do a fan email because I can just let <laughs> people look at the text messages. Slight... First invitational, then bordering on slightly threatening towards the end uh, <laughs> from Miss Danny Fernandez being like, when we doing goofy? Like, and then towards the end, it was just goofy question mark and like anger emoji back when I was like, girl, we working on it. <laughs> all I, wanna, all I, I just want to convey because I guess people, not everyone knows that this is a cult classic. This is something that just blew up in a way that it was a sleeper in the 90s. Um, I'm sorry if it didn't resonate with people that were older, but those of us that grew up in the 90s, it was like a massive thing. And then it had a huge like reunion and comeback and you could get Powerline shirts at Target and now Disneyland has all this stuff. I mean, they've taken notice. And so that's the only thing is I always try to tell people like, even if you're on the outskirts of this, there is a massive following for it. Um, and that's it's just such a it's a cult movie. It's iconic 90s Disney movie. Very and iconic 90s Disney movie. We're going to be yeah. talking about today because a goofy movie has a lot of different elements to it. Like Danny said, it's a beloved classic in some eyes. It's just a movie that came out to other folks. Before we get into our feelings about the tomato meter, which again is 61% barely fresh. Jacqueline, I turn it over to you for the synopsis. What is a goofy movie about? The tagline for the film is it's hard to be cool when your dad is goofy. Yeah, it's hard to be a goof is basically the sentiment of a goofy movie because in this we fall follow Goofy Goof, who is our the goofy that we know from the comics, and his son, Max Goof. And basically Max is raised by his single parent dad, and he is trying to woo the very lovely Roxanne, who Danny is very closely cosplaying today with the <laughs> braids and the shirt. I, I, I spotted that. But basically, yeah, it's like the last day of school. Max is trying to woo uh, Roxanne. He wants to take her to the to the big 
the big thing. He was like, I'm going to show her how cool I am. I'm just like Powerline, but he's a goof. So he's goofy and everything. And the worst thing he ever wants to be is just like his dad. We open literally the movie with him talking about how much he does not want to be his dad and how he just really wants to rewalk San. And so instead, Goofy decides to take him on a road trip. And anything, you know, about father-son road trip, there's going to be a happy family moment. So Goofy is essentially the villain of this because he is trying to rip Max away from Roxanne and make him more like him and take him on this adventure. But through the course of adventure and through some lovely songs that sort of culminates in Powerline, which is basically a mix between MC Hammer and Bobby Brown and a little bit of Prince, that is where they come together and they realize he can be a little goofy, he can be a little cool, but he'll always be Goofy's kid. Very heartwarming father-son moment. And yeah, and that's the end of the Goofy movie. It is literally one of the most perfect movie musicals ever created. And I mean, I will, look, in this y- in this podcast, I will discuss. I uh, we're seeing eye to eye here, Jacqueline, but we're going to turn it over to Danny Fernandez first for the question at hand, which is Danny, the tomato meter is 61 percent for a Goofy movie is Rotten Tomatoes wrong about a Goofy movie. Rotten Tomatoes is so wrong about this film. I honestly, if it's not 100 percent, I would say it should at least be 95 percent. This is one of the most uh, perfectly made Disney movies. It is, like Jacqueline said, super heartwarming, has a tremendously amazing original soundtrack that you are right. They try to combine Prince and Michael Jackson. Tevin Campbell nailed it, knocked it out of the park. It is Those songs are so catchy and iconic. Um, and yeah, it has the title character. I mean, it has Goofy, you know, that we all grew up with. But also you see Mickey and a couple of other, Donald, you see a couple of other uh, iconic Disney characters that pop in there. But yeah, this is just uh, universal. I want to say this is a universal experience of being embarrassed by your parents, trying to impress your crush, and having to go on a trip with them when you're just... I I think it's hilarious, Jacqueline, that you said Goofy is a villain. Because if you watch this as an adult, you're like, okay, Max is a brat and his dad just wants to get close and take care of him. He's a single father and he's heartbroken over the fact that his teenage son wants nothing to do with him. Absolutely. So, but at the time he was villainous because there was nothing worse as a teenager than being forced for sure. to hang out with your parents. Yeah. Also, I might add that I learned something very depressing, which is that you spend 90% of the time with your parents before you turn 18. Wow. And that mm. after that time, you only spend 10% with your parents. And if you don't have children, it is even less. Well, I mean, okay, I'll accept that because <laughs> I'm not going to. So I'm not going to have a kid just so I can hang out with my mom more. My mom and I get to see each other plenty. Yeah. Um, Jacqueline, it seems like you were on the same page as Danny. Do you feel Rotten Tomatoes is as wrong as Miss Fernandez does? This is going to be so weird. I don't think there was a movie that I felt Rotten Tomatoes was more wrong about than Constantine, just because I'm like stacked up <laughs> against other things. So what you're going to get is like movie nerd deep dive on a goofy movie, because in addition to rewatching it, because this is the best thing about this movie and in lovely Danny Cumming, she also selected a movie that was only an hour and 10. So you best believe I queued that stuff up <laughs> on Netflix because I was like, I mean, on Disney Plus, because I was like, I need to watch this. I'm going to like watch the whole thing. I wanted to dance when Powerline happened. But really looking at it now through my post Encanto, post um, generational trauma Disney, this movie was so ahead of its time. It's the Disney that we have today. They just did it 25 years earlier. And when you like hear the history of like Carter Burrell and Mencken and sort of the architect of the golden age of Disney and how this was really an homage to what we had already lost. Girl, let me just tell you, this is... It's it, it's about to be everything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, came out back in 95. And so it was a movie that I missed. And we'll get into the reason why I missed it at the time. Uh, many reasons why I missed it at the time. But for me, I'm going to say Rotten Tomatoes is wrong. I feel like this movie definitely deserves much more praise than it got at the time from the critics. And I feel like they just sort of dismissed it as, well, it's not a big, hyped up Disney Lion King, Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast sort of release. It's this legacy character. It's based on a goof troop this is more like a made for tv thing than anything else and they just i in my opinion i feel like the tomato meter just kind of looked at this movie and is like oh this is just the thing for kids and just kind of shoveled it to the side and when you go back and watch it 
Holy crap. Because I saw this movie for the first time at Danny's behest as an adult. When I finally sat down and watched it, gave me all of the emotion in the right place where the father-son relationship really hit me hard. And so I never looked at Goofy as the villain because I saw this movie as an adult for the first time. So I was just looking at, at all those punk-ass teenagers. Just just, just help your dad. Your dad loves you. Just, just, your dad is suffering, Max. Just throw him a bone once. He's a freaking dog. Throw him a bone once in a while. So we're all on the same page. Here. We're going to be defending a goofy movie. Before we get into our movie talk segment, let's turn it over to our expert review creation uh, manager, Tim Ryan, who is uh, or the Rotten Tomatoes stalwart. He sort of uh, looks at all the reviews of the critics at the time of the movie's release and tells us what they were saying when this film came out initially in April, way back in 95. Two minutes with Tim. Disney's theatrical features, The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, and The Lion King, might have won all the awards and critical praise, but the late 80s and early 90s saw another development in Disney animation. The studio started dusting off its most iconic characters for the small screen, with Scrooge McDuck in DuckTales, Donald and Daisy Duck in Quack Pack, and Huey, Dewey, and Louie in both. Even Mickey got a new short with Runaway Brain in 1995, although that one played in theaters. Goofy was especially busy. The series Goof Troop debuted in 1992 and ran for two seasons. It was spun off into a 1995 theatrical feature simply titled A Goofy Movie, and in 2000 it got a straight-to-video sequel, An Extremely Goofy Movie. Each of these explored the relationship between Goofy, who was very goofy, and his son Max, who is not. The critics largely found a goofy movie to be reasonably amusing, with a few solid gags, but more like an extended TV episode than a feature. A goofy movie is 61% on the tomato meter with 28 reviews, and it has a 70% audience score. So what did the critics have to say? In a fresh review, Jackie Potts from the Miami Herald wrote, Wisely, this fast-paced movie has enough colorful characters and rollicking gags to keep the tykes from getting bored. However, in a rotten review, Stephen Holden of the New York Times wrote, a goofy movie is engaging in its mild-mannered way, but the story is too rambling and emotionally diffused for the title character to fully come alive. The Rotten Tomatoes critics' consensus reads, A goofy movie offers enough of its titular ingredient to satisfy younger viewers, even if most parents will agree that this beloved character deserves better. So that's a goofy movie. Let's kick it back to Jacqueline and Mark, who have spent this segment contemplating why it is that Goofy is a dog, but Pluto is also a dog. Back to you, folks. I, I was literally thinking that, Tim. You took the words right out of my mouth because they had a dog and then they're like, we're just going to keep Pluto as a dog and we're no. going to give Goofy, we're going to put funny skis and stuff on Goofy. But you, you did have Pluto there already. See, I definitely, living in our current climate, definitely understand the dichotomy between Goofy and Pluto, because that's just like, remember some of the collective things we got everyone to do during this like time and certain people did it. I feel like Pluto are those people. They're the people where you hand them shoes and say walk. And they're like, you know what? I'm just going to be a dog. I don't really want to like, I don't want to grow up. That's exactly who those people are. So the goofy people are the people that are like, we're going to do this together. Goofy as it were. And the Pluto people are like all fours. Danny, you go to Disneyland on a on a regular basis. Is Pluto still a presence at Disneyland or is it all Goofy? Uh, no, I think they still have Pluto. I don't see either. I see Goofy more. Th I think they still have Pluto, though, I feel like. But I was going to say the wild thing that happened a couple years ago was this massive like meme, I think, on Reddit about Maribel the cow because she's so similar to Goofy. And I think that there's <laughs> like, they might've dated or something. So Ooh. everyone was like, is Maribel a dog or a cow? She's a cow very clearly, but that's like a whole, I'm way that too in. I, I'm way, way too, too in. <laughs> I'm, I'm way too into all of this. That's uh, deep. I know too much Disney well, lore. That's what happens when you become a Disney character. They give you a big Bible and you get to know. <laughs> it's like when you're the president with like JFK and UFOs. Girl, they give you a whole. <laughs> don't give that lie. I interview those people. They barely know their characters' names. <laughs> they give you a whole Bible and you get to find out all the secrets. You get to see the Walt Disney head, cryogenic head. You get all of that. That's You're the, the only one thing. that read it. You're the yeah. only one that read it. <laughs> you, want to, you get to go to the vault and actually witness Walt down there like Austin Powers. So, all right, let's move on to movie talk. Let's get into this. Everything that we can gush about with a goofy movie. 
Yeah, I, I really don't understand some of these critic reviews, Danny, because there's a critic. I won't name the critic, but at the time this movie came out, they said that a goofy movie was a Disney quickie without any heart. And I feel like the one thing that if you want to lob some criticisms at this for being breezy or, or not even being a, a, a technically a feature because it's only 70 minutes, fine, have at it. This movie is so full of heart, though. And so I, I feel like that's it's, it wears it on its sleeve. Like, how could you not see that this movie is full of heart. I'm just curious for your perspective on this, Danny, as a child when you first came across a Goofy movie and if you look at it the same way now as an adult. No, I mean, like I said, I think that I switched. Uh, I started to side with Goofy. I think the older you get, especially as your parents get older, you know, and there's such a complicated relationship there and you think like, yeah, I was uh, rebellious when I was a teen. That's super universal and common. But you just, when you go back and watch this, it's like this dad was doing the best that he could and he just loved his son. And he says that repeatedly that he just wants to be a part of his life and really touching, heartwarming moments. I was going to say this, <laughs> this, I almost feel like I would normally say when someone gives a review like that, like, were they on their phone? Uh, but there weren't phones back then. So I don't know what they were busy playing Tetris or something. I don't know. So it's Mario 64 uh, <laughs> and wasn't paying attention to how much heart. But aside from the heart, I do want to say go back to the soundtrack. I mean, they really didn't have to snap like that. And they did <laughs> for the fact that, you know, we talk about uh, iconic soundtracks like The Lion King, uh, like Aladdin and stuff. Um, but to this just was so 90s in such a perfect way. And it's such a pump up jam. And like they did a perfect uh, nod to Prince and Michael Jackson. And Tevin Campbell is just wow. This is how I know Tevin Campbell, by the way. Really? Just through a goofy movie. Uh-huh. Oh, my God. Yeah. So I will just say that um, I, I have to add this. Uh, this was written by Carter Burrell, who is a very, like, he was like an indie uh, rock hit sort of producer. So think of that very sort of, like, live verve people type time frame. That's what he was doing during that time is he was kind of doing that. But he was also a composer and lyricist. And his first job was actually working with Coen Brothers. He did Blood Simple. He did Miller's Crossing. He did Fargo. And in between all of that, he did a goofy movie and all of these like big popcorn things because I think he was just like a struggling musician. So like literally you're getting a guy who would go on to win Oscars and like be nominated for Oscars for movies like Carol and Three Billboards Outside of Ebbing, Missouri. And he literally is also composing this and he's composing this in homage to Howard Ashman who died mm -hmm. in 1991 doing Beauty and the Beast. And so this movie is literally a 90s kids version of Belle, of uh, Beauty and the Beast. The soundtrack really impressed me because I still they still play it at my gym sometimes, like, like in the morning. And when you're doing the early 6 a.m. workout and you're trying to lift then, you need some power line. And it does wake you up. And it's a great companion to what the rest of this movie is. And as I alluded to before, this came out in 95. And so I was sort of like, if this movie was goofy, then I was Max at the time. Because that's right when I was like 14 or 15. And I'm like, I'm too cool for Disney. Like Disney's for kids. And I want to be like a cool adult. I want to get into other stuff. And so you just totally dismissed this movie when it came out and I never paid it any mind. And then you get older and that's just sort of how you have it in, in your brain is that this is a kid's thing and I'm an adult and I just missed this time window. You know, it's, it's like I caught on with Ren and Stimpy and Rocco's Modern Life and that might have been the last sort of animated fair that I cared about until I grew up a little bit and I looked back and I was like, oh, that's some really good stuff. But a goofy movie always fell through the cracks until Danny's like, no, you need to see this movie. And then when I saw it, I was so surprised at how emotional I got at the, mm -hmm. there's a scene early on where where goofy is so clearly just trying to relate to his kid and he just wants max to be his buddy and because goofy's a lonely guy like goofy goofy mm -hmm. needs a friend and you're not so, as a parent maybe you shouldn't rely on your kid to be your best friend but goofy just wants to bond and he went on this fishing trip to idaho with his dad and so now he just wants to, max to have the yeah. same thing but max is doing the same crap i was doing where you're too cool for your parents you want to drop you off a block away from school when when you're going to the dance and nobody sees you and they just think you rode there on a magic carpet i guess and he's trying to impress roxanne and then we're off on this adventure and it really did the movie touch 
touched me. The alphabet soup scene really gets me. Danny, what's the scene for you that you still think of every time you watch a goofy movie and you're like, that that is the best scene in this movie? Yeah, I think the high dad soup would go against any anybody that says this doesn't have heart. Is if you don't cry during that scene, you don't have a heart. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's it's um, so sweet. He's he's basically Goofy is saying when he, when Max was little, he used to t- write little things in the alphabet soup, and one of them was hi dad. And oh, oh I, <laughs> yeah, it's just so sweet. And and so they're fighting and they're not speaking to each other, and he hands him a cup and it says hi dad, and it's just. So sweet. <laughs> it's, it's even better than, Jacqueline, it's even better than the end of Field of Dreams. Like the, hey, yeah. dad, want to have a catch. It's even better than that. Well, we might as well get some shut eye. I don't think we're going anywhere tonight. That moment, absolutely for sure. But Mm -hmm. the father son song as they're floating on the river, that Mm -hmm. that's it for me. Like when they finally anything that's great is great. If you can then put it to song, I'm even more like down for it. Also, little fun fact on this one, the voice of Max, Bill Mm. Farmer did Goofy. Um, who mm-hmm. I think voiced Goofy like just a ton anyway from the cartoons and Jim Cummings was there too. They basically had like the roads, like I, I would say like the murderous row of like voice actors, even, you know, Polly Shore who pops up both in this, but also in the Goofy TV show, which I also feel like needs a bigger like play in the sun, <laughs> which was the TV show that ran on Disney Plus that I used to watch every morning. It was Aladdin and Goof Troop, like like right, right next yeah. to each other. Like I loved it. But J- Jason Marsden, uh, who also voiced it, Thackeray Binks from Hocus Pocus. So like this mm. was like a part oh. of that Disney channel when they were just churning out these movies with like the same people. Sometimes they were like direct to video versions. And I think that's what people right. thought with this. Like this, they thought this was the return of Jafar. They thought this was Tarzan too. They thought it was, and th- those are movies that actually I think predate this, but it's this idea, not Tarzan too anyway. It's this idea of like taking the popular thing and then doing a direct to video release. And they thought that's what Goof Troop, a Goofy movie was. And they thought that's what this was about. And it wasn't. And I think that's like where a lot of the, the hate kind of came from it. Well, they also wanted a more human, I mean, Disney wanted to have a more human emotional uh, resonance with Goofy. Cause if you think about him as a character, I mean, all those, uh, all those like uh, driving video, remember the ones from the fifties, the yep. old like PSA Goofy. Um, and so you never, you only see this character being a clown. And yeah. so you don't ever see like his emotional, I mean, that's what Disney's known for is kind of like gutting you uh, ever since like Bambi, you know, gutting you with like emotional um, <laughs> scenes. And uh, so I think that was very smart of them to show a human side of this character. Max, by the way, was just the coolest. I don't know anyone that didn't have a crush on him. I had a massive crush on him. Also had a crush on Roxanne, been very open about that. Yeah. I mean, they were just like, how can we, how can we get like, te- it's funny, Mark, that you didn't watch it as a teen because I think they definitely went into it with like, how can we get teens? How can we get young people? And also if you watch it as an adult, it resonates as an adult as well. I I mean, I'm glad I didn't see it as a teen because because Roxanne might have done weird things to me. You know, I mean, <laughs> like, just like Jessica Rabbit, Roxanne. I put her up there with Jessica Rabbit. Um, and you've, I, you've actually been Roxanne for yes. Halloween. Yeah, I actually was Roxanne also on a, our friend Hal Rugnick. He has a competition called Tournament of Nerds at UCB and I competed as Roxanne <laughs> and won my round. That was great. It was so fun to play her. I'll have to post when this episode comes out. I'll post uh, pictures of me. But I also, you guys, at the 25th anniversary at El Capitan, uh, this was before the pandemic, everybody dressed up and went out. It was all out. And I knew everybody was going to be Max or Roxanne. So I went as Lisa she is the hot blonde who yes. says, who's that guy? Mm-hmm. And I went as her and everybody actually won the competition. Or at least I remember I like was a finalist because I was I was only competing against myself. Like nobody thought to dress like her. And she's hot. I wore like hoop earrings and this hot black crop top she wore. And I'm like, this is a, I love this style. I could wear this to the club. And I did. That's a good that's a good pro tip for for cosplayers. Like if you're doing like an event like that, go yeah. with the off-brand character. Don't dress 
because that's that's always my fear going to a Halloween party because I'm not that original or creative as you two already know from dealing with me. So I'm just worried I'm going to have like the crappiest Batman costume. But if you pick something that's like original and that nobody else is going to do, but they'll still know and Lisa's perfectly in that wheelhouse, as I would also say, Jacqueline alluded to this character is Pauly Shore's Bobby. Uh, yes. I believe it's yeah. Bobby uh, Z Zimersky who yeah. creates the Leaning Tower of Chiza. And I didn't know that Pauly, my close personal friend now, was in the movie. And so I'm watching it for the first time and I hear Pauly's voice and I'm like, oh, crap. And, but it's the perfect timeline to have Pauly Shore in there because he's super hot off of Encino Man and Son-in-Law and In the Army Now and all, the, and all of his like run of movies, Biodome and stuff like that. It's great to have Pauly Shore in addition to all the other Disney stuff. So it's not just like this father-son feel-good movie. You also get to like follow a fun group of high school teenagers, Jacqueline. I mean, yeah, that's the best part of it is it goes back to this idea of when you were a kid in the 90s. And so many of those things, if you happen to be a kid in the 90s, brings you back to it. Danny, you did not like glass on this enough. This was a microcosm of, I think, a version of high school that was both authentic, but still not depressing. Like there was just yeah. enough <laughs> angst and there was just enough comedy, but there was just enough absurdity for it to feel separate from what you were dealing with, but still completely universal and, and relatable. The thing that's interesting about it now is like just the little things. It shows the absurdity of cassette tapes, um, big shoulder pads, like all of the very 90s things that we obviously know about, but if you mention it to someone now about the fact that like literally the the cassette tape would start like fitting out at you, like the string, that is not something that you get when you just stare at a cassette tape now as a Gen Z person. And the, the, the high school dynamics, like even discussing lunchroom politics and things like that, like all of that stuff was there and I loved it. No, it's so funny. There's in classic Disney fashion, because this is being made by adults, there's adult humor in there. So, uh, and also Lester's Possum Park. I have to yes. give a shout out to Lester's <laughs> Possum Park. Uh, making fun of the Chuck E. Cheese animatronics. I mean, that, it, that, that whole right scene there. is so comedic, so funny. Uh, my brothers used to, he smack, he's like, don't hug me to the big uh, possum mascot. And he hits him and says, beat it, doofus. And my brothers and I would say that to each other so <laughs> much but yeah there's a there's a ton of comedy in this so it, it it is entertaining as an adult to watch it and still see some of those uh adult jokes that are in it as well and we learned something about adulthood th through goofy's eyes and that is the office bully the person mm. who you're gonna grow mm. up and you're gonna have i remember my high school basketball coach would always say that you're gonna yes. it doesn't matter what line of work you go into you're gonna have to deal with sharks and we get the classic shark voiced by Jim Cummings, who is Pete, Goofy's nemesis for ye for decades in, in one form or another. And so here he's Goofy's co-worker who always tries to one up him and is and he's got the best camper and and his his son and Goofy's son are really good buddies. And so that's sort of how Pete finds out that Max lied to Roxanne and is trying to steer Goofy towards L.A. so then go see Paraline. And that dynamic is also something that I found really rewarding in this movie was Goofy not just trying to reconnect with his son and form a lasting bond, but it's also, Danny, it's the challenge of Goofy trying to one-up Pete and sort of getting a leg up and not being the, uh, the, the office, you know, the, the, the nerd of the office anymore. Mark, did this remind you, this father-son dynamic and the bullying remind you of any movie that travels back in time? It's a little back to the future. -y. And we, right, and, watching and your dad riff. be yeah. bullied. Yes, and your dad's kind of like this nice pushover, like goofy, nerdy dude um, who actually does stand up to him. But also I want to say, Pete is a cat. I'm keeping track of all the animals that are happening. <laughs> <laughs> so classic dog, cat rivalry yeah um, but yeah we all remember being kids and the rich kid the rich kid got the playstation the rich kid got he had a pool and <laughs> you had like the blow up pool and, and generational family trauma that was built up by that wealth but never coddled through actual emotional intimacy yeah we got that <laughs> <laughs> see look at all it's doing the levels i don't know get off your phone when you're watching this movie and pay attention to the the care that they put and um and one one final thing I wanted to say was Jacqueline circling back to the music, not just talking about Tevin Campbell, but you were talking about the composer. Is that um, that scene when 
the scene on the river um, after that song has such great, like it's the music so emotional, the swell, it's like very jarring. Um, they, it's a, a life or death situation actually that Goofy saves his son life and then his son saves his life. And I just like also cried during that scene and they embrace and it's just like, wow, I'm, I'm in awe of this movie. I, I really do have to talk. I'm going to give this moment. Like, a lot of people know Carter Burrell, and I, I hate that this is what he's known most for, which is Twilight. But say what you will about Twilight, that Bella's lullaby is a bop, 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 and a half, okay? okay. So, like, yeah. they knew how to make songs. There's a reason why those are the what plays underneath the TikToks, and everybody knows it's Twilight, because it's catchy. But this man did Carol, another movie about huge, unrequited love. You know, like Roxanne barely speaks in the movie. Let's be real. True. It's mostly like yeah. Max, like staring off to the side of her. I swear to God, the opening of Carol where she sees Rooney Marta in the hat, that might as well have just been Roxanne when Max is like singing his I want song at the beginning. It's like the exact same thing. It is like, this is what I want. Um, this is the guy that orchestrated the Big Lebowski. So just imagine him doing something so over the top as that and then doing something like this, which again, I feel like it's just his sort of like punk rock alt indie version of Beauty and the Beast. Like finding love, because this is the love story. That's the other thing. It is a love story between a father and a son. They fall mm -hmm. in love on this journey. It is. It happened one night that is like old school falling and, and realizing that this is the who the person I'm supposed to be with, i.e. supposed to be in this case. But yeah, it's all there. And that, I think, goes back to this idea of like, they just dismissed this as simplistic and didn't see the nuance that was being layered in of the absurdity. It's the fact that everybody sings on the song that they're driving out of town from. There's some, there's a lot of musical theater, I would say, license that they mm -hmm. take in this that makes people dismiss that, oh, no, this was very deliberate. Like, this was very purposeful in how we did this. And it is absurd, but it has heart underneath it. That's the other thing about this movie to me is that if you were to make this competitive and, and put all the Disney movies into like a March Madness sort of bracket, right? Then you would have the Lion King would be a number one seed and Cinderella would be a number one seed. And you would have a goofy movie barely making the the field and it would be a bubble team. It would it would get in there and it'd be like a 12 seed. But this movie could beat anybody in its path because the Lion King and Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin, they're also they have that like based on a fairy tale veneer that everybody loves rushing out to the theater to go see with the Disney movie. This one came out in April of 95 and it it made its budget back twice over, but it didn't quite crack $40 million in the United States, whereas your big time Disney movies at that time were doing $200, $300 million at the box office. So it didn't get that kind of attention. But even though, and, and the music was such a signature Disney touch, and the music in this movie is just as good as anything that you'll see in any other Disney movie. And my favorite song in this film is actually the After Today one that they sing at the beginning when Max is like, just get me through. If there is a a song that just encapsulates the teen angst of the repetitive nature of just, oh, I got to go to school again today and I got to deal with all the lumps of it. There's two songs that I put above everything else and it's Alice Cooper's School's Out and it's After Today where it's like, just get me <laughs> out of here because after today things are bound to get better because you're not going to be in, in school anymore. That's the one that does it for me that just and it really sets a tone for the movie with Max is feeling and he's just on emotional overload. Danny, what's the song in here that you find yourself most responding to? Uh, I guess I still love Eye to Eye. We actually in my um, dance team, Frisco High School in Frisco, Texas, I was on the dance team there and we did a dance to both Stand Out and Eye to Eye. I think we were like so again, we we're like pushing this movie so hard even back then that we like made our instructor like let us do it, uh, I think, for our spring show. But if you listen to the lyrics, it's like so Heart, you know, about coming together and just like leading with love. And I just, I was just listening to it this morning when I was getting ready. And I'm like, God, I just, <laughs> I hope more people, I hope you more young people. I'm going to introduce it to my niece and nephew because I just need more young people to uh, hear it. I think, yeah, I mean, and knowing that how much you and your brothers watch this movie, I imagine your brother's doing a pretty good job raising the kiddos with, with a goofy movie in their hearts. Uh, Jacqueline, your take on the best song in a goofy movie i mean i guess i already kind of gave it through it's the best song it's the best thing but nobody else but you I'm like it's a lot it's like it's 
Danny will be driving around, and Danny has the, I, I believe Danny still has the full soundtrack, and it just comes on, and that's when the volume knob goes up, right? Oh, it's, I mean, it's perfect pump up when you're getting ready. Uh, karaoke, I want to say. It's great for karaoke, great for working out. I mean, there's no, you can listen to this soundtrack for anything. And I mean anything. <laughs> also, though, I will say uh, the singing voice for Max is not the same as the speaking voice. They have a different one. Uh, the uh, Bill Farmer did both, but. I was kind of surprised by that because I thought that was his voice. I didn't realize it was somebody else singing, which I'm always like sad about that. Uh, you did talk about the box office, Mark. I want to remind everyone, Disney was gearing up for Pocahontas. Like Pocahontas gets released like mm. three, yep. three months after this movie. And I think that also is people's minds is because if you know anything about a Disney release, if but when this movie is coming out, they decided to, they were promoting the other movie already. So it was yeah. almost like while you're graduating, they're already talking about your younger sister's wedding. Like it's like, you know, it's like it's it's not it's not really the the moment. Um, and honestly, I think it's so funny because this movie was supposed to be Jeffrey Katzenberg's return to greatness. They modeled it off of Beauty and the Beast in almost everything that they did in so many different ways. And it ended up being the thing that got him kicked out at Disney because it, its failure is what Michael Eisner used to kick him out. So this is actually considered the death of a Hollywood executive, which I think is very interesting. So the man who made this movie, who put all of his blood, sweat and tears into it, Miss Danny, uh, it basically killed him. So it was his it was his white whale. I don't know how he feels about it now, seeing how big it is. It's like there's literally merch of it now. That's how much millennials have a say in things is there's literally after 25 years, they now have merch of this at Disneyland. Like I said, it was all over Target. It was, They were like, oh, you oh, you like this movie? Oh, OK. We No, we can do this. And they started. Oh, Max. Max is at California Adventure. That's a huge thing. Not goofy. Max goof is at my friends and I saw him. They were wearing a Powerline shirt. He was out there. He was waving. So that's huge to me. You know, when they normally have like Mickey to have a massive line for people that want to meet Max from a movie that came out and a show that came out in the 90s. Like that's how big we were like, no, we love this movie and you need to pay attention. And they were like, we hear you and spend money here, please. Yeah. You you mentioned wow. the event that you attended at the El Capitan celebrating the 25th anniversary. I didn't realize this, but I was at D23 in mm -hmm. 2015 when they did the 20th anniversary and it was a big deal that I know, uh, I think uh, Jim Cummings, uh, Bill Farmer, uh, Jason um, Marsden, Pauly Shore w w uh, sent a video message, I think. And so they did like a big event. And but again, it just gets overshadowed by something because obviously everybody was at D23 wanting to see Star Wars stuff because The Force Awakens was coming out later that mm. year. And I didn't also realize this is that a goofy movie opened back in 95. It opened at number two at the box office. Do you know what movie, what classic buddy cop movie opened at number one that same weekend? Looking for Bad Boys. Bad Boys oh, opened yes. at number That's one. That's hard to go against. I That's know. hard yeah. to go against. That was, that was Will Smith and Martin Lawrence uh, teaming up and defeating Goofy. But At then the there time. was also Tevin Campbell uploaded a couple of videos in 2016 of him doing songs with the band Enfield. And they and they did I 2 I and they did stand out. And so this stuff just continues to have legs. Danny, do you see a future where a goofy movie it can sort of bear more fruit? Or do you think that it's just going to be this cultural touchstone from the 90s that maybe a few generations glom on to, but we never really do anything new with? Oh, no, there's definitely uh, going to be goofy stuff in the future. I know that they that that IP has been asked about. I know because I asked about it. <laughs> uh, You're like, and I have really me. good. Uh, I have no I have really good reps. And they were like this person who I can't name has already claimed it. But, you know, things shift and move. And with the pandemic and like we said, uh, Disney and Marvel's Star Wars, like all of their track of things that they're trying to put out right now. But I can guarantee you that this IP will continue on that I do know that Jacqueline yes. that's what I love about Danny is mm -hmm. that when she got to have that <laughs> meeting with Walt Disney's frozen head the one question she <laughs> asked is like hey what are we doing with the goofy movie is there anything new going on <laughs> 
I really do. Like, Danny, stop. <laughs> I mean, look, they let you in the house. They can't be mad yeah. if you're starting to set up yeah. furniture. As I say all the time, listen. <laughs> Mark Trust. knows. Mm-hmm. Mark <laughs> knows. Uh, that's a nice thing about working to the level that I've gotten at. That now, whenever I ask about something, my people are like, "Oh yeah, let's set let's set up uh, something with you." And that y'all comes from a decade of <laughs> working yeah. in this business. <laughs> no. Um, so Danny and I, I think we're about like nine or ten years apart. Jack and I are two or three years apart. There seems to be this divide between early 90s, the big Disney blockbusters and the late 90s Disney blockbusters. I'm obviously on team early 90s. And I'd say my favorite blockbuster of the 90s from Disney was it's I want to say a Lion King, but it just feels like that's such an easy answer. But but Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin for Robin Williams's performance are way up mm. there, too. What's mm. your favorite? What's y'all's favorite 90s Disney movie? Is it early 90s or is it late 90s Disney? Well, it depends on what you mean when you say ask that. You mean Disney movie altogether in general, every iteration? Are you talking about Disney? The the, the blockbusters, the the, the big, big releases. Uh, Nothing beats Lion King. Like, I, I'm saying this as someone that grew up with every single birthday, I was a different Disney princess. My parents literally, <laughs> f- w- like, with Aladdin, I was Jasmine. They had, uh, <laughs> I grew up in the 90s when they would have uh, these girls that would come. They would dress up as the princess or whatever and do your makeup and stuff. And so that that that's the birthdays that I would have. I had a Belle. I had a Little Mermaid. I had, and all of these Disney princesses still got to go with Lion King. Most iconic soundtrack, like, also just heartwarming, um, crushes your heart, then picks it back up. I don't think there's anything more iconic than also just the animation, that opening scene. I remember when they released that, the trailer, like it's just the most iconic 90s Disney movie. Well, I lost money in Vegas then, Jacqueline, because I bet on Danny saying Hercules. I'm out. That's what I was going to say. Well, Hercules is also, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, that's my (laughs) choice because like I love The Lion King. I really do love The Lion King. And it's not just because they have women narrate black women narrating the the plotting. And as a mm-hmm. as a black writer, I'm like, of course, I'm home. Literally, <laughs> I'm trying to narrate all the movies that I'm watching that did not enlist a black woman to be a part of that process. So I love that they just gave me that off the get. Um, no, it is Hercules for me. I'm not even saying that I think Hercules is better than Lion King, better than Aladdin, or better than Little Mermaid. But there is something about Hercules that I just love. I love that it hits more things about Disney that I like now as an adult than it did when I liked it as a kid. I think if you're asking me which one of those movies did I like from that time period, I would definitely say Beauty and the Beast. Like at that time, Mm. nothing topped Beauty and the Beast for me and probably Mm. still to this day in a lot of ways. But legitimately Hercules, it just hits me different. It hits me different of the like, wanting someone to be proud of you, girl. Because there's a whole line with Phil about like him being like, that's Phil's boy and like that. Yes. But there's also something about like Hercules wanting him, wanting his father to be proud of him. And there's the broken girl inside of me that therapy is helping to repair that just like it hits differently <laughs> than the girl who's like, I want to find a man. Yeah, well. Also the muses. <laughs> yes. The muses. The so- muses. And Meg is more of the perfect, like, I like stories yes. with slightly broken women. Anyone that knows me, like, The Apartment, Heathers are my two favorite movies. Like, look at the center characters of that one. Not exactly got their shit together. But <laughs> that's why Hercules hits me different is because she's, like, literally her love song is about how much she doesn't want to be in love. And if that is not... And how some, she can't stand you, men. Yes, yeah, exactly. I was like, thank you. Yeah, Scene no. represented. Exactly. Okay, so Jack, Jacqueline likes Liberty Bell women where where, where the, you can see the cracks. You, you can see there, there's flaws. Absolutely. There's, but, but, we're, but we're still whole. We're, we're, we're still, still whole. We're, we're still no, give me forward. slightly broken women because these like together happy bitches. I'm sorry. I'm very confused. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to... <laughs> Mark knows that I went to Greece recently with my friend Cheyenne Wulu, and we were playing the Hercules soundtrack so much. And I'm like, they're probably so annoyed with us. Also, no one Greek was involved. In it. But we went to the Parthenon and like I saw like, you know, the muses. I saw the, go- the gods and God. And I was like, yes, this is just like what I grew up with. 
Um, so the yeah, actual they gods and playing. goddesses looking down, they're like, really? We're, we're just Disney? I understand Russell Crowe's pain in the new Thor movie. I get it. Yeah. I feel you, Zeus. I'm with you. Because I grew up in Colonial Williamsburg for a time, and I was there when Pocahontas was released the same year as a Goofy movie, and everybody was fawning over Pocahontas. And us in Williamsburg were like, that's not how it went down at all. No. So we were, we were not fans in Colonial Williamsburg of Pocahontas. But we are talking about the one particular Disney movie a goofy movie and it still stands the test of time maybe not in terms of box office at the era in which it was released but ever since it's taken on a life of its own and is still out there today an extremely goofy movie not as beloved just kind of there and existing but who knows maybe you'll get another iteration and a proper sequel to a goofy movie sooner rather than later and with that we are going to transition to our mailbag let's open it up brian Always nice to have some high dad soup in the morning. So this is from our catch-up crew member, Ben Norris. Y'all can be like Ben anytime you want. Just email us. Rotten Tomatoes is wrong. That's RT is wrong at RottenTomatoes.com. And you can give us your thoughts on what movies you think we should be talking about. Or if you heard an episode and you had some feelings, share them right there. Ben is emailing us from Northamptonshire in the UK. And Ben says, love the show and listening to all the back episodes has kept me entertained upon many an hour. In terms of Brad Pitt films, which we recently covered, he has some absolute stinkers, according to Ben. Seven years in Tibet, which was about seven years long. That's fair. Uh, The Devil's Own, just for the accent alone. And Meet Joe Black, I Wish I Hadn't. Saying that, he did make Seven and Inglorious Bastards, so he has redeemed himself many times over. Keep up the good work, and thank you from Ben Norris. Yeah, that Brad Pitt episode has really uh, made the rounds there, Jacqueline. Uh, I'm going to ask Danny in a minute for her favorite Brad Pitt movie, if she has one. But as far as Brad Pitt flicks, like we talked about the Legends of the Fall, the Meet Joe Blacks of the world. I actually went back and I saw Legends of the Fall again. It was on TV the other night. I, you just get sucked up in it. You just get wrapped up in the story. Yeah, no, I don't disagree with you. Also, he said uh, the devil's own for the accent alone. Fair, but I would counter back Meet Joe Black for the accent alone. Brad Pitt does a patois in Meet Joe Black, which is the greatest cringeworthy awesomeness that I have ever seen. I have a counter to that. I have a counter to that now. That is the greatest scene. We we had a fan that is from the region and they wrote that, I think we thought it was a Jamaican accent, but he was actually doing some sort of, it was like a particular Caribbean accent. And according to this fan who who wrote us, and they said that he did a dead on No, that's right. No, he did a dead on impression, but he is still white as crystalline doing it. So like, that's listen, fair. Like, that's fair. Commitment doesn't necessarily make it better. <laughs> I'm not like, saying it should have been done, but I'm just saying I'm, I'm going to give I'm going to give our fan credit for pointing that out. So thank no, you no, for pointing out fair. that Brad Pitt, who's yeah. from who, who checks notes is white, did a very good Pat's Law once upon a time in Meet Joe Black. White from the Ozarks, dude. Yeah, Ozarks, I mean, like his, like literally Ozarks, very white. That's what like we upbringing, say. And Willie he's white, doing that. even though he's got a very good tan with those abs. Uh, Danny, do you have a uh, favorite Brad Pitt movie off the top of your head? Yeah, I guess my favorite movie that he's in is Ocean's Eleven. Uh, oh. That movie is just still holds up. Watched it recently. It always like tickles me as a writer of like, how can I create something that's as cool as this and has this large ensemble love that he committed to eating in every single scene. I mean, just as an actor, it's just fun to to play. But I do have to say, I think uh, one of his earlier roles that really was like, wow, was Interview with a Vampire. Uh, was just like, whoa, who, you know, uh, was still being introduced to him. And it's just like, who is this? Man, I think I just grew up seeing him in tabloids because a lot of his films I couldn't watch when I was little, including that (laughs) one, including Interview with a Vampire. Um, And so I just always knew him as uh, Rachel. What's her name from Friends? Why am I blanking? Rachel Rachel Green. Green. No, from Friends, his wife. Jennifer Aniston. Oh, Jennifer Aniston. 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 Oh, okay, I always yeah. just knew him as Jennifer. People are going to laugh. I just knew him as Jenner, Jennifer Aniston's husband um, and then Angelina Jolie's husband. Um, but yeah, a lot of his, you know, like I said, I'm a 90s kid. So a lot of his films I could not see. Uh, but when I did finally see Interview <laughs> with a Vampire, I was like, whoa, he really showed up. Uh, I thought he was a great actor in that. But yeah, Ocean's Eleven for my favorite film that he's in. 
Interview with the Vampire came out uh, five months before a Goofy movie was wow. released. So that is going to do it for us here today on Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong, a, a an episode for all times, kids, because we've been wanting to do a Goofy movie. We've been wanting to have Danny Fernandez on forever. Danny, it was a pleasure to have you join us. Uh, there's a there's a snoring, I would say, Roxanne that is right at my feet right now. Aww. Her name is Molly the Wonder Dog. I know you are uh, friends with her as well as I. You are the mother of Molly the Wonder Dog. You first adopted her way back when you were in college i was a teenager Texas. yeah mm -hmm. and yeah. she's still y'all have had so many adventures together do you sort of look at yourself as maybe the goofy to her max wow yes she is very irritated by me at all times <laughs> although she's older than me she's a gold she's like in her 90s so she's technically my elder i feel yeah. like she's a an, an old frosted face lady that i have to take care of every day and give like applesauce to so <laughs> she's she's definitely ma from the golden girls uh, Danny, where can everybody find you out there? I know, I know you have so much stuff in the oven, so many things you can't quite talk about just yet, but uh, what's the good uh, like social media for for everybody to go find you? Yeah, so I'm at, on Twitter and Instagram at Ms. Danny Fernandez. It's M-S-D-A-N-I-F-E-R-N-A-N-D-E-Z. -E I still have my Pride comic that dropped in June. Uh, there's a great Harley Quinn cover. This is Pride DC 2022. You can call your local comic book shop if they're out because a lot of them sold out. Uh, but there's an amazing cover by Jen Bartel that has Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy. I wrote a love story of them uh, that is very fun uh that's in there so yeah you can pick that up at your local comic book shop uh once again you can email us anytime rt is wrong at rottentomatoes.com whatever you do to support your favorite podcast do it for us you can subscribe rate review whatever your preferred platform asks you to do go ahead and do that and we could get more guests like danny fernandez in the future talking about beloved films like a goofy movie films that have been wrong by the tomato meter because it's just barely fresh at 61 percent we think it should be way way higher this was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us, Danny. Make sure you find her at Miss Danny Fernandez and all the wonderful things she's doing. For the entire crew here, producer Lucy, expert engineer Brian Perez, our review curation manager Tim Ryan, Jack Woodcoy, my wonderful co-host, and once again, to the great Danny Fernandez, Molly the Wonder Dog, who just woke up, I am merely Mark Ellis, and it doesn't matter what kind of a week you've been having, kids. Just remember that after today, things are bound to get better.